Chapter 4 One night I was at Lacage, struggling to make my watery glass of Coke last so that I wouldn't have to put out $5 for another one. It got expensive going to clubs all the time on a grad student stipend, and it would be hard to explain to Seth that we could only eat ramen for the next month because I'd spent all of our money on tips and overpriced drinks. The bar wasn't very crowded. There were plenty of empty seats, so I was a little surprised when a guy came over and sat right next to me. I recognized him immediately. He was another regular, routinely making the rounds of all the local strip clubs. I'd noticed him before because he was a sort of rock star among the customers, frequently surrounded by the cutest dancers at the bar, or sometimes tucked into a shadowy corner with just one dancer. They'd be sitting closely together, exchanging hushed words, their faces nearly touching. His popularity was a bit odd because he wasn't the coolest looking guy in the place. He was probably in his late 50s, yet he had the gawky gait of a teenager after his first major growth spurt. His face was a small round bulb, punctuated by wide eyes and a protruding nose, all capped by a gray Romanesque crown of hair. Do you mind if I sit here, he asked. I gave him a free country shrug of the shoulders and went back to carefully tensing my cheek muscles so that I was taking the smallest possible sips of Coke. Listen, he continued, I don't want to intrude on your personal space, but if you want someone to talk to, you're welcome to join me. I found this strange since he had already taken the stool to my right. Wasn't he technically joining me? But, he said, if you prefer to be alone, that's fine too. Uh, thanks for letting me know it's okay to be as I was, I thought. After all this time going to the strip clubs by myself, I had developed a kind of protective coating when it came to the advances of other customers. I knew all the lines, which basically amounted to numerous drunken variations on, Are you a dancer? You should be. It wasn't that I minded some casual bar flirting, but I found that if I started talking to these guys, either they wouldn't leave me alone, or they would do something else to make me regret ever opening the conversational portal. One time, I was talking to this cute guy in his late 30s about work, his dogs, and the movies we both like, when all of a sudden he stopped mid-thought and said, Wait a minute, you're not a hustler, are you? Because I'm not going to pay to have sex with you. These kinds of experiences made me reluctant to talk to other customers. But since I'd seen this guy around a lot, and I was trying to make my coke last, I said, I'm Craig, what's your name? Dave, he answered, shaking my hand. I've seen you here and at other clubs. Yeah, nodded. You seem to get around too. The bartender, a brown-haired guy in a sleeveless muscle shirt, passed by and took Dave's drink order, a gin and tonic. Then he disapprovingly eyed my drink, which was about three-fourths empty and had taken on the color of drain ditch water. Uh, you want another one of those, the bartender asked. Uh, sure, I said, and I could almost feel my pockets getting lighter. You can put that on my tab, Dave said. Thanks, that's really nice. You're welcome. So what brings you out tonight, other than the obvious, I said, gesturing toward a dancer walking our way. Well, Dave answered, I usually come out on Friday and Saturday nights. It's my reward for being good all week. What do you do? I work for the federal government. I'm in management, he answered as the bartender returned with our drinks. Have you been coming out to the clubs for long, I asked. Well, I used to be married. I was married for 21 years, and after the divorce, many years after the divorce, I started coming out. First, I went to the clubs in Baltimore. I was a little concerned about running into people I knew from the office, or maybe even my ex-wife. But one day I got tired of making the 30-minute drive. So you obviously enjoyed yourself once you started coming here. I was like a kid in a candy store, he said. I hadn't touched a man in 21 years because I was in a monogamous straight relationship. After all of that time having these desires, and then all of a sudden it's available, I kind of went bonkers. He took a sip from his drink and then asked, what about you? Well, I'm actually here for school, I started. But then I noticed his attention had drifted away. He was staring at a dancer who had just climbed onto the bar. I'd met this dancer before. His name was Matt. He was a nice guy, but not my type at all. He had dark hair. He was older, probably in his late 20s. And unlike his shaved and naturally smooth co-workers, Matt sported a thin coat of shiny black hair over his tall Jim Harden frame. On this night, he was a vision of seeming contradictions, with thick black rim glasses, neatly combed hair, and black leather chaps that exposed both his butt and his dangling dick. 
He also held a leather writing crop in his hand, which made him come off like a naughty librarian who dished out very kinky penalties for overdue books. Matt looked at Dave, and then he snapped his fingers, motioning for Dave to come over. Excuse me for a moment, Dave said, getting up from his stool and walking toward where Matt was standing. There were people seated in front of Matt, but they had to scoot over to make room for Dave. As soon as Dave was in front of him, Matt kneeled down. Dave put a buck in one of Matt's socks and took a round mini tub of elbow grease from the other. He liberally applied the lube to Matt's dick and started working on it for several minutes, stretching and pulling until it stood fully erect. The customers who'd been pushed to the side were now watching intently. Once Dave helped little Matt reach his full growth potential, the other customers started to clap. Thank you, Matt said to Dave as he stood up and stepped over toward his other admirers. Dave, all smiles, headed back my way. He sat down, grabbed a couple of cocktail napkins off the bar, and wiped his hands. That was fun, he said. No matter where I am, Matt will pick me out and I have to go service him. Even if there are people lined up three and four deep at the bar, they have to clear a place for me. Matt will stand there until I take care of him, because the hard-ons help him make money. Dave grinned proudly and continued. Matt says that I should teach masturbation at the college level. He's a nice kid, Dave continued, but typical Generation X. He can't figure out what to do with himself. Dave continued, taking another sip of gin and tonic. So, what were you saying about school? I'm the type of person who can start a conversation, walk away, and then pick it up ten years later without missing a beat. Oh, I said, I was just saying that I'm sort of here for school. I'm in grad school, and I'm studying the clubs for my master's thesis. Really? I know it sounds weird. The people at your school allow you to do that? Yeah, it's all about understanding sexual subcultures, yada, yada, yada. I'm interviewing a bunch of dancers about why they strip. What do they say, Dave asked. Well, it's complicated, but most of them say they do it just for the money. Yep, I've heard that too. But let's face it, there are a lot of other ways to make money. You can do construction, hang drywall, or whatever. You don't have to take off your clothes for money and let other guys play around with you. Yeah, I guess, I said. One of the things I'd noticed in starting my research is that so many people, even those who had never stepped foot in a strip club, felt that they knew exactly why people chose to strip. And these homegrown theories almost always contradicted what the strippers themselves had to say. Dave said, now one of the things I've heard is, where else can I make this much money in so few hours and at the same time have people buy me drinks and I can drink on the job? You don't believe that, I asked? I think money is part of it, but some of these guys are really narcissistic, really into themselves. So I think that exhibitionism is another big factor. But the real big reason is that a lot of these guys just need attention. A lot of them are starved for love and affection. Many I've talked to come from broken homes, and they want that approval from you in the worst way. What makes you think that, I asked. Well, an example is the way they'll come over and flex their muscles for you. It's like a little kid showing off for daddy. I think I'm a father figure to some of them. There's this one guy, a cute kid, whose father was an abusive alcoholic who was in the military. It sounded like the dad probably beat him a lot. And here I am, this older guy who will listen to him and not be judgmental. You can tell it strikes a chord with him. And what do you get out of it, I asked. I sometimes explain it to my other gay friends like this. Going to a regular gay bar is a lot like fishing. You have to spend four or five hours hoping that you're going to get one fish that wants your hook. But by coming here, I can eliminate all of that. I know that there will be some hot young guys, and I can stroke them, and stroking dicks is probably my favorite form of sex. I love doing it. There's nothing more satisfying to me than playing with another guy's dick. I really get a kick out of making another guy feel good. So by coming to the clubs, I'm guaranteed to be able to get exactly what I'm looking for, and I can do it within a very narrow time frame. So it's efficient, I asked. Exactly.